Good afternoon, everyone. This is Tim Pichot, and today we have a throwback episode for you. And before you know where you're going, you've got to know where you've been. And since we knew where we've been in the past, we we're able to predict what is going on today in the uh, financial markets. And as you listen to this episode, you'll notice that it does sound pretty prophetic. This was initially a client-only production, and I didn't have the time to find the video file that went with this MP3, but nonetheless, it is still very informative, and it will still give you a very good indication of what is still yet to come, because this is only just the beginning. I also have the Perfect Storm is Brewing podcast as an addendum, which it was originally intended to be an addendum to this, but somewhere along the production lines, uh, this recording never made it out of the cloud or never made it out past uh, my clients. But if you head over to thelibertyadvisor.com, you can find links to the other shows where we did this as not a case of, oh, hey, look, look, look over here. We've got a lost episode where we predicted everything because honestly, you know, several of the other episodes we had both before this and after this uh, were, you know, if you go to the, uh, the episode we recorded on December 23rd, at the end of that episode, I've got like 10 minutes of where it's sort of like a highlight reel of everything that we said, or just a, a small smattering of what we said that ended up coming true. But while you're over there, you can also schedule a 15 minute complimentary call with myself. We can go over your portfolio, tell you what we'd do for you. And, you know, really the only way we can make this show grow is by your patronage. And we would like to thank everyone who has given us a chance. And first off, we want to congratulate all of you because you're absolutely killing it probably relative to all of your peers. And second off, we do appreciate your business, trust, and loyalty. But without further ado, here is the throwback episode that was originally recorded on May 17th, 2018. Hope you enjoy. Hello, everyone. It is May 17th, 2018. And today, what I wanted to touch on was the stock market valuations. So right now, I'm looking at an article from Zero Hedge that is titled, These Four Stocks Account for Over Two-Thirds of the 2018 S&P uh, return. So what we're looking at is, you know, you've got Facebook, Apple, Netflix, and Google uh, pretty much represent almost all, the, I mean, two thirds of the market gain. So if you're taking a look right now with me in this recording, what you see is that, you know, a lot of the sectors have not been doing, you know, amazing. And it's really a lot of the S&P 500 has really come down to Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Microsoft. Now, generally speaking, a PE ratio is it's usually the most widely recognized way to value a market that stands for price over earnings. So the clip notes on this is the higher the PE ratio, the more expensive a stock is. And what we can see from this chart is 15 is about average right now. And currently we're sitting uh, closer to 25. So 24.75 as of today's recording, which means that the market is trading 50% higher than what it normally uh, should given a fair market value. So the market could get chopped in half and still be fair market value. So that's not really a great thing to look at. But then when we take a look at the individual companies inside of there, uh, when the, you know the big companies we just mentioned, the, what they call the FANG stocks, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. And what we take a look at this is, you know, someone over here like Amazon is actually trading at a PE ratio of 257. And what's interesting about this is that Amazon as a company has historically actually not made that much money. Uh, in, until recently, they weren't even making money. It was, and right now I'm looking, I'm looking at a chart and it shows, you know, and it has a green line of revenue and then the blue line is earnings. And the earnings are almost non-existent. Uh, I mean, in two, 2015, it was hard to even see the earnings on this calendar, or sorry, on this chart. Now, for the longest time, Amazon wasn't even making any money at all. They were. It wasn't until they got the cloud contract through the Central Intelligence Agency that they actually started making money. And, I, and another uh, interesting thing that I read the other day was that Apple had actually, sorry, Apple has made more money the past three months than Amazon has the entire time they've been around. So I'm talking about net profit, not, uh, not revenues, obviously, because right now Amazon is you know taking up over everything when it comes to uh, revenues. Now take a look at some of the other companies in this index, like uh, Netflix. And I'm looking at this in real time right now, so I'm I'm just typing in Netflix. And over here we see a PE ratio of 260. I mean, so you know the two PE ratios I just mentioned. I mean, those are absolutely uh, astronomical numbers that you just don't really see and something that, you know, for many stocks were even higher than what you saw in the dot-com bubble. Facebook, which is now uh, sitting at 30, which is 
over twice as much as what you'd consider normal. But again, you know, there are some growth prospects in Facebook. However, you know, they are probably more regulatory hurdles to deal with in terms of compliance and having to hire people on and, you know, making sure, you know, fake news, I guess, doesn't get spread around. And again, I'm not going to make any comments on fake news or Russia or anything like that. But, you know, certainly, you know, there's going to be added cost to Facebook's business model that I think some people aren't really factoring in. Now, Apple uh, and Google seem like they're like the two in the mix that are actually reasonable, especially Apple sitting at 18. But, you know, there are questions of, you know, how much these guys really can innovate in the future. And Google was another one and I'm pulling up, I think it's like 24 or something like that. But let me pull this up right now. Actually, sorry, I was way off on that. It's app and technically it's Alphabet, but their PE is sitting in at close to 60. And again, you know, people right now are just really paying for the uh, you know for the revenues these companies are having they aren't really they don't really care as much about the profits but you know if you do back out those few companies you've got you know that's two thirds of the entire stock market returns are just those companies and those companies right now are sitting at gigantic gigantic valuations that are even greater than in some cases greater than that of what we even saw during the dot com bubble. Now, another way people commonly value the stock market, actually, this one isn't as common, but it's the cyclically adjusted P.E. ratio or CAPE. And so what it does is it just smooths out the P.E. ratio over over 10 years as opposed to just looking at the last trailing quarter. And what we can see here is we're pretty much at the exact level we were at in 1929, right before the stock market crashed. So I'm just eyeballing this right here, trying to get the exact number, but it looks like we're at, we're at uh, close to 30 back in a little over 30 during 1929 and now we are closer to 33 and now the only time that I was really higher than this was during the 1999 internet boom when it was at 43 so right now it's been very very frustrating for me you know being in the position where you know accurately predicting Trump was going to win and then you know wanting him to kind of pick up the pieces but not thinking he could actually solve some of these longer term issues and some of the things that have really gone on and I've really have harped on this quite a bit, but in 2014, late, I mean, pretty much 2015, uh, as soon as we stopped printing money, the Federal Reserve, then a couple of days later, the Bank of Japan increased their money printing. Then a few months later, the ECB, the European Central Bank, they started printing money, which they've never actually done before, buying up their own debt, Japanese buying up their own stock market, the Swiss National Bank buying up their stock market, buying up our stock market. And so it's really distorted the market. So, you know, think of this as a, uh, you know, like an eye of a storm. And every time we went through and printed more money, we just basically increased the radius of that storm. But unfortunately, uh, eventually we're going to have to go out the other end of that. And all of this has been predicated on massive amounts of debt. And last month we did have a record amount of, of money that the treasury brought in. Although I would, uh, you know, let people know that is when people pay their taxes in April. And you had a lot of companies who were repatriating their money. So when you have companies that repatriate their money, what happens is you get a temporary, you know, kind of shot in the arm. You get a boost. It's a nice, good steroid to get you going. But you know, there's only you can only repatriate your money so many times. You know, if you're if you're Apple and you repatriate all your money back over here, well, you know, you're not going to be able to do that the next quarter or the next quarter. And so, you know, this was you know a shot in the arm in terms of the uh, you know, the tax revenues that we brought in. But this is not something that's sustainable. It's something that we did also in 2004. And, you know, if you had invested money in 2004 and, you know, basically, you know, after uh, George W. Bush's second term, you were actually down money. So, you know, four years later, you were down, you were actually down money. Uh, you know, there was actually a case where after 10 years, you were down money. And really what I'm trying to get is that every time the CAPE ratio has been where it's at right now, the stock market over 10 years is only averaged 4%. Well, now you can sit in a 10-year treasury and get a tiny bit over three. It really kind of depends on the day. I didn't look at it right now, but it's right around 3%. And, you know, that the reason why that started going up is because as the Federal Reserve, you know, I'd mentioned before how they were printing money and then they stopped. Well, now the central banks, a lot of them around the world, have are either about to stop printing money or have stopped printing money. And the Federal Reserve is actually not only not printing money anymore, they're actually selling $30 billion of bonds a month. So we're at this inflection point where, you know, there's this really kind of mass optimism that's going on. You know, people are, you know, who were very, very pessimistic before now basically gone, gone whole hog into this market. So I think that that is a contrarian indicator. And one of the reasons you couldn't really have a crash 
not that, not that you couldn't, but one of the major factors is when, when everyone's super optimistic, it's very hard to, uh, sorry, when everyone's super pessimistic, you know, there's so much pessimism already out there and factored into the market, it's hard to really see a big move downwards. But you always see, you know, the consumer confidence indexes, those are following indicators or lagging indicators. They're not leading indicators. So they're not predicting anything. They're only talking about what, what people have experienced in the past. And this is very disheartening. And for people who are listening to this, you know, you can head over to howitsrigged.com or for right now, go to the libertyadvisor.com. There's a section in there called How It's Rigged. Depending on when you're listening to this, I just, um, you know, made sent that to my web guide today. So I'm not sure if the um, if the rerouting has already occurred. But I, in there, I have a 16-page uh, booklet that shows how they rig the inflation data, how they rig the GDP data, how they rig the unemployment data. And so it's just very frustrating, you know, seeing somebody like Trump, you know, call out these numbers being fake when he was a candidate. I mean, he called out 42% unemployment rate, which you know, I think was sort of ridiculous. But, you know, there are other rates that he mentioned several times, you know, in the 20s. You know, he mentioned how this was the most phony baloney number he's ever seen or this the unemployment number is the biggest joke out there. But now that it's his number and it's what he's running on, it's what he has to hold his head on. And again, I'm not wishing him any ill will. I'm just trying to, you know, say this as someone who's thinking rationally over here. And what I, I think is that people who are getting caught up in this market right now and people who were very pessimistic and now are, you know, fully on board and want to be 100 percent the SP 500 and can't get themselves enough, you know, FANG stocks, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, you know, I think that they're going to be in for a hurting. And so, you know, for people that have gone this long, you know, either being conservative or, you know, being middle of the road and now want to, you know, kind of change strategies completely and go, you know, more aggressive, you know, if you do want to do this at the new company, you know, that's going to be set up any day now, we are running strategies that are going to be, you know, very uh, helpful for this. So, you know, if the market does go down, we're going to have, you know, basically ways to, you know, make sure your loss is stopped out and not through stop loss orders. We're doing it through options. And if the market goes up, you're going to be able to gain to that because right now we are in uncharted territories. And, you know, this stuff that's been going on with central banks right now selling bonds, that to my knowledge has never happened before. We've never had this, certainly this level of bonds being sold that we've never seen this before. And there's no way that this is going to end well, you know, especially since the government was running a hundred billion dollars a month deficit. And so if you're running a hundred billion dollar a month deficit during all these boom times, then, you know, what's going to happen if we actually do end up having a recession, you know, next year, you know, are we going to be running two trillion dollar deficits? And, you know, these tax cuts only matter if, uh, you know, companies are actually earning money. And a lot of these tax cuts recently for the repatriation went back to companies who then brought the money back here, which temporarily increased the tax revenues, but then they went and then they bought back their own stock. So now they have less stock outstanding, which then temporarily increased the earnings per share. But it's all sort of this, you know, I don't you know, maybe shell game, but it's all sort of these, you know, accounting gimmicks that, you know, are not going to, that in the long run, you know, you know, when the tide goes out, as Warren Buffett would say, we're going to see who's left swimming naked. So it really just bothers me a lot to see, you know, people who, you know, they were very, very pessimistic. And now, you know, at the, what you know, I deem one of the worst times possible now, you know, getting as optimistic as possible. This is the second longest we've ever gone without the market going down. I believe the only other time uh, it's gone on longer than this was the 90s bull market. But even then, you had a lot of good factors going on in the 90s. You had the baby boomers at their peak spending years. Uh, so people reached their peak spending years at age 46. Now, all those 46-year-olds are now closer to 70, which at that point, you you have forced liquidations. And so, you know, there there's, are some headwinds right now. And, you know, back then, you also had the emergence of the Internet. And you had, you know, a lot of other good technologies uh, coming online. And, you know, now some of those technologies that are coming online are, you know, blockchain based, you know, decentralization that I think is going to be around to stay. And uh, actually, the company that I left, uh, you know, recently, the broker dealer, I wasn't allowed to talk about blockchain investments. And now, lo and behold, I found out yesterday, they are running their own fund now that's dedicated to blockchain investments. So, you know, four months ago, it was, you know, this is scarlet letter, you're not allowed to touch this. And now it's, you know, hey, by the way, we've got our own fund. So I don't know too much of the details about that. I just I did have a colleague who sent it over to me, but it just, you know, really pains me to see people who are going to be probably making these moves at the exact wrong time. But again, you should only really the only thing you should really be concerned about is if you are close to retirement, 
there are different ways out there where we can, you know, make sure that at least the amount of money you need in retirement that we're going to be able to cover that uh, through either some sort of fixed means, whether it's dividends, whether it's a business you own, whether it's interest payments, whether it's an annuity, whether it's, you know, um, you know, other options that are out there. But, you know, that that's one way. Uh, and then from there, you know, we can invest accordingly. If you have 20, 30 years, you know, you can afford to be more aggressive and just know that you just have to have a good handle on what your risk tolerance is. But for people who, you know, have been conservative and now all of a sudden want to become more aggressive and, and sure it is very, uh, you know, smart for anyone to question their advisor to question me or to question anybody on what people's strategies are because, you know, the ethos that's out there is everything is going super, super great. But, you know, what I would surmise is that the GDP numbers right now uh, coming in at 2.3%. I mean, the last three years of Obama, it was, I think, 2.2. So, I mean, we're not too much better than what Obama did. And right now, you know, the debt is actually growing at, you know, for every $6 we're spending, it started to take $6 for us to spend to increase the GDP $1. And, you know, any businessman will know that you don't spend $6 to get $1 back unless you've got some gigantic growth potential that we don't know about in the future. So you see this debt, it's all coming online. You see the interest rates starting to go up. You see the Federal Reserve is now selling bonds. These are all very, very negative signs uh, for the stock market, at least in the short term. And so, you know, all this optimism, I think, is what was needed to eventually have the market go down. And just to remind people, you know, this has been four months since the stock market has hit a high. I mean, if you look back to, you know, 87, you know, it wasn't like, you know, all of a sudden October came and boom, everything, you know, went down one day. You know, there was other signs that happened earlier in the year, like the increase in volatility pickup. You know, and this is something that I talked about January 25th, you know, a week before the volatility index completely blew up. This is, you know, so it's not like a Monday morning quarterbacking this. And if you remember going back to 2008, I mean, there was shock waves that hit the market earlier on in the year and everyone sort of, you know, kind of dismissed it. But eventually, you know, come September, there was a big crash. And so, you know, it it's not like these things that happen, you know, usually it does happen all at once, but there's other signs that happened before. You know, just look at, you know, the uh, subprime auto market right now. The subprime auto market is actually doing worse now than it did in 2008. So there's more people delinquent on their auto loans today than there was in 2008. So, I mean, that sounds, and that's, a lot of it has to do with the interest rates going up just a tiny bit. So I'm going to try to search that out right now. So sub prime autos so just bear with me just a second and here we go yeah subprime chaos the auto bubbles bursting and the data is worse than 2008 so here we have a chart and we're looking at you know the prime interest rate going up just a tiny bit and we see you know the subprime uh delinquencies have increased uh, substantially and and so much so even greater than 2008 and so you know that's not a great sign and when it comes to people purchasing homes uh, you've got the interest rates going up, you know, about 4.65 today on the 30. So, you know, if someone, you know, like myself got a mortgage at 3.75 and now you're looking at 4.65, historically it's still low. But, you know, if people are strapped for cash, you know, that's, that is going to make a big difference in how much of a house they can afford. And again, when it comes to the unemployment numbers, you know, how, I mean, yeah, the number is 3.9%, but they don't count people who've been unemployed for a certain amount of time. They don't count people who have their doctorates and are now, you know, waiting tables. They don't count people who are, you know, work, you know, one day a week helping out odds and ends, you know, you know, if you work one hour a week, you know, you are not counted as being unemployed anymore. So there's all these different things that they do. And, you know, I don't think the economy is as strong as people think it is right now, which, you know, I think is going to lead to um, a lot of people, you know, basically making the wrong move at the exact wrong time. And, you know, it's something that definitely pains me. But, you know, it's, I was wrong on the timing of some of this stuff. I was wrong that, you know, I thought in 2015, after the Fed stopped printing money, that we'd see, you know, things start to go off a cliff. But, you know, that didn't happen because of other forces that have never happened before in terms of other central banks printing money. But, you know, I don't want to have to worry about any of this stuff, which is why we have the strategy of, you know, if the market's up, you know, you're up. If the market's down, uh, we're going to be able to, you know, use options to be able to limit your downside loss, which at the end of the day, and again, this is something that's going to be better for people who are closer to retirement or already in retirement. If you've got, you know, another 20, 30 years, then, you know, you can wait it out. 
But you know, certainly though, though the market is very, very expensive. You know, if you look at the top 30 different ways people measure the market, almost every single one of them, if it's not at a high, uh, is super close to the high. And and so just you know, really, you know, at some point something's got to give. And and maybe the most bullish case uh, of the stock market is things get so bad that the Fed has to start printing money again, and the market goes to infinity because now our money is worth less. And so, you know, that's where the term comes from, worthless. You know, things are getting, we are becoming worth less money because we print all this money. And so right now, I would just advise people to stay the course. And, you know, if you, you know, haven't talked with an advisor like myself, then, you know, I'd give us a shot at info at thelibertyadvisor.com. But it's just, you know, very, very, you know, disheartening to see this. And, you know, I think a lot of people are getting, you know, sucked into, you know, the Make America Great Again atmosphere. And again, I have... A uh, hat that I spent two hundred fifty dollars on before he was even elected. Uh, that's signed by Donald Trump. That MAGA hat. And when my daughter's, uh, you know, was born, the, his first day in office, and I had a Donald Trump shirt. So I'm not, you know, anti-Trump by any means. I just want to, you know, be honest with people, and I don't want to, you know, sucker them into. I don't want to just act like a salesman of, hey, you know, everything is great, and let's just pile into more S and P five hundred stocks because. You know, I don't think that is the way to go. And there's been a lot of head fakes. And, you know, I think there is a good chance that the high that we saw a couple of months ago, four months ago, could be the could be the high of this cycle. And again, the market could go down quite substantially. The market could go down to 17,000 and it would still at that point just be fair market, fair market value. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of craziness is going on. I think a lot of complacency is going on. A lot of optimism is going on. You know, the optimism, you know, consumer confidence indexes hit you know, all time highs in 2007, 2008, you know, what happened right after that, you know, now we're, you know, even blown through those numbers. And, uh, you know, people, you know, this is not an indictment on the president. This is not saying I don't want him to succeed. This is not, you know, I want to bet against America or anything like that. It's just that, you know, I think people have been caught up in this. A lot of things that have happened have been short term moves, the tax cut for uh, the companies repatriating their money, short term move. And, you know, really the market is, is all driven by these FANG stocks. And once you take that out of the equation, it doesn't look nearly as good. And those FANG stocks are all, uh, not all of them, but most of them are incredibly, incredibly overvalued. I mean, how many people out there are, are aware that Apple has made more money the past three months than Amazon has the past 15 years? I mean, most people don't, you know, have no idea that that is the case, but it absolutely is the case. And, you know, I don't think this can go on forever. Um, now, I guess back in 1999, Amazon technically, you know, didn't even have a PE ratio because they weren't making any money back then. But, you know, now they, they are, now they are, they are making money, but it's not very much money relative to what they're spending. And people are willing to spend, you know, over 200 times their earnings to buy that stock. And same thing with Netflix. And, you know, and again, you know, people are cutting the cord and more people are buying Amazon every day. But, you know, at a certain point, it just gets to be a little bit ridiculous. And a lot of this money was going into these companies because it was all predicated on 0% interest rates. Well, now we're not at zero. We're still pretty low. But, you know, it's every incremental step above zero when you've got this much debt, both as, you know, companies have debt. You've got, you know, almost record margin debt going on right now. People borrowing money to buy stocks. And it's just all signs that end up uh, compounding on itself once you see interest rates going up. So, you know, not to sound like Debbie Downer on this because, you know, long term I am optimistic, you know, I'm cynically optimistic is, you know, a phrase I like to use. But, you know, if you are close to retirement, you know, there's things that we, that we should be doing. You know, if you're my client, we more than likely have already done that. So, you know, I, I thank you guys for listening to this. And, you know, I think there are there is a lot of things that we can do in the meantime to help prepare for what ultimately could be coming because, you know, no one knows how this is going to shake out. You know, anyone, you know, the same people who, you know, couldn't see things happening in 2007, 2008, the same people who are super bullish today. And, you know, I just want to make sure that my clients, myself and my family, that we're all protected. So again, you guys can go over to info at the Liberty Advisor dot com or shoot me an email there and we, we will uh, get you taken care of but anyways thank you for listening and talk to you guys later so this is just a quick little addendum to it and then i've got a seven minute video attached but since i posted this uh actually i guess i didn't post it but i'm wondering if you know jamie diamond from jp morgan chase and i are on the same wavelengths because there's right now there's a zero hedge article talking about the perfect storm hits yields diamond warns we don't fully understand that's in quotes impact of unprecedented QE wind. And he goes on to say, it might force the 10-year up. 
if the Fed boosts short-term rates more than expected, so that's in brackets, you can easily deal with 4% bonds, and I think people should be prepared for that. Well, I'm not sure if we can uh, really be that prepared for 4%, but anyways, as we continue, the U.S. will have to finance by the end of the year $400 billion a quarter. That's a lot. That's a huge shift from the past. He also goes on to say, he, Jamie Dimon, this may cause more volatility, higher rates in a way we don't fully understand, given the fact that the exit from quantitative easing is unprecedented. He also goes on to say, we've never had QE, we've never had reversal, Dimon said, and that we are the markets are in uncharted territory when it comes to what central banks are setting out to do. So anyways, this is a perfect dovetail into the recording that I made last week, still just as pertinent as ever. Hope you guys enjoy, and uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. It's Tim Pichote, and what I wanted to, do, to talk about real quickly, I don't want this to be a huge, long, drawn-out discussion, is one thing that nobody is really talking about is the perfect storm that is brewing right now. <laughs> We have a Zero Hedge article that talks about the U.S. just borrowed $488 billion in one quarter. That's the most since the financial crisis. And actually, it's the second most ever. Uh, the most ever was uh, the fourth quarter of 2008, which was the financial crisis. So compare the conditions then versus the conditions now. Now you have you know, record tax receipts. You have everything supposedly going well uh, versus the backdrop of 2008, where obviously you know the world was you know at you know, basically at the brink of collapse. And so, you know, this is just a very, very bad sign of things to come. Now, one now one of the other big things that I want to talk about was the Federal Reserve balance sheet. And just eyeballing it, it appears that, you know, it peaked out at about four point a little over four point five trillion dollars. And now we're down to four hundred and thirty five uh, I guess 4.35 trillion. So, I mean, essentially, just eyeballing this, the Fed's been able to get reduce their balance sheet by 150 billion. Just they've been talking about maybe getting it down to two trillion, which means they've got another two trillion dollars to go. Uh, so, obviously, they've done nothing. Now, the big news is that that is then that tiny, tiny, tiny bit that they have done has sent major shock waves. So, at one point, the 10 year treasury, I think, was as low as 1.3, maybe it was 1.2, and then recently it just got over three. Now, when it does get over three, that's going to attract more money from the stock market into into bonds. So then that way, people are now getting compensated for taking on higher risk. And traditionally, when the stock market had valuations that it has uh, where it's at right now, uh, at least as measured by the uh, CAPE ratio, the cyclically adjusted price index, is that usually uh, you know the forward ten year return is only four. So if you can get you know a quote unquote risk free rate in the bond market of three percent then why are you going to go risk at all in the stock market to only get four? So that's just one important thing to keep in mind. Now, another thing people aren't really talking about is that the Fed, since, you know, the, if, since the government had to issue almost $500 billion of debt, I mean, that would make it close to on um, pace of $2 trillion that the treasurer would need to issue. Now, I've been saying, you know, only lowballing it over here, uh, saying that they were, were going to have to issue $100 billion of debt, they being the treasury. So if you add that $100 billion onto what the Fed's doing, which is about $30 billion a month, getting up to $50 billion come, I think it's October, every three months it ratchets up. So it started, uh, I think it started at 10, then went to 20, then went to 30. And now uh, it was, it's going to cap off at 50. And so then you're looking at a situation where you're looking at the Fed trying to get rid of $150 billion, or basically the treasury, the combination of the treasury and the Fed having to find buyers for $150 billion a month. Now, traditionally, the buyers were the Federal Reserve. Well, they're actually now the sellers. The other buyers were the Chinese, who now were in, you know, essentially, you know, the beginning of a trade war with them and, you know, telling them to go take a hike. So that's not a good sign. They also have the new Petro Yuan that they've just released recently. And then the third largest buyer is are the Japanese, and the Japanese are pretty much the most indebted country in the world with a debt to GDP over 200%. So all these things, and again, I'm not trying to poo-poo the president or anything, but you can see the optics on this are really bad. That um, you know, again, this is you know, the, with the Federal Reserve raising rates already five times since Trump's been in office, or since he was uh, the you know the president elect. Uh, I guess because technically it was raised once when there was that you know lame duck interim period. Uh, you know these forces are much much larger than any one president can you know basically you know take credit for or, or accept the blame. Now the problem is Trump has taken a lot of credit for things that have gone on. Yes, the stock market is um, you know doing well relatively speaking, 
but a lot of that was because these tax cuts didn't really go to you know that business owner making a hundred thousand or making a hundred fifty or two hundred. You know, really, you had to be you know for like an S corp. I think I haven't looked at it recently, but I think you had to be over about a quarter million dollars to see any benefits. A lot of um, the service businesses or pretty much all service businesses didn't even get one of the major credits. But the, you know, one of the main beneficiaries are people lower down on the totem pole. And then also you've got you know the major major Fortune 500 companies who can now repatriate money. That repatriate repatriation is just going towards comp companies companies that mainly hated the president buying back their own stock. So that is going to have a temporary boost to the stock market. But again, that's all you know. I think really we're doing a lot of things. Uh, I guess pardon my language, but we really have basically just blown our wad on a lot of this stuff. And so when we eventually get into a crisis. What's you know what's the Fed going to do? You know they've they've got you know hardly any room to cut the rates because they didn't raise them fast enough because they wanted to really game the system to have the Democrats make their economy look better than it really is. And uh, we're just in a situation where there's really no way out of. It. I mean, how do we you know what if we start running two trillion dollar deficits and we're in uh, you know we're in recession? I mean, at this rate, we're looking at two hundred two trillion dollar deficits in boom time. So. You know, what if we get into a recession and all of a sudden we need we need to finance you know three trillion dollars of spending and then the Fed instead of buying uh, sorry instead of selling bonds has to now buy bonds you know that's going to have huge ripples uh, throughout the investment uh, community and so what we're trying to do over here what I'm trying to do over here is help protect people from that so you know if you guys are close to retirement you know there's a lot of things that you can do right now you do have a chance you do have an opportunity to protect yourself. Now, the main uh, risk that I see for people that are close to retirement is something called sequence of return risk, where it doesn't matter what your average return is, it only matters what the order of those returns are. So you wanna make sure that you know what you're ultimately conserving is your purchasing power, and it doesn't mean keeping all of your money in dollars if you think that the, that the one thing that you know might happen with you know, the Federal Reserve having a reverse course could make the dollar go down, probably then the last thing you wanna do is to conserve dollars. You wanna conserve purchasing power. So we've got ways that we think uh, you know, will benefit from what we see is coming. But anyways, that's just the perfect storm that we see coming because you know, we don't see a lot of this reported on the fake news media. You don't see a lot of this reported on, uh, you know, on the, certainly on the financial sites. And you know, really the media just wants to be able to tell you what to think. They wanna be able to tell you, focus a narrative on this is what you need to think. This is what you need to be focused on. And really, this is an issue that's much, much higher up, higher level issue. And I just want to make sure that my listeners and viewers are, uh, are aware of this. And thank you for everyone that's been watching. Thank you for everyone that's been listening. I really, really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, drop me a line if, uh, you know, if you want me to cover any other issue. And uh, thank you very much. Take care.